All right, Jerry Mace, the Kicking Lawyer. Thank you guys for joining us for another Law Talk. As always, if you haven't yet, please like, follow, subscribe to the content. We're available on all social media platforms as well as podcast platforms. You can watch it on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, so please check us out. And we are on TikTok, Josh's favorite, as he does all the dances all over the there. dances. Any of the TikTok <laughs> dances, just go to the Kicking Lawyer uh, page there, and that's a lot of fun. And then we want you, if you haven't yet, please download the album Inside My Head by the local guys in a the band. It is free. Helps them out a lot. Support the local guys. Uh, we just want to give them some some help. And then Michelle Allen's been a longtime sponsor of our show. If you're buying, selling, renting, leasing real estate, she'd be glad to help you out. She's also working real hard with the Junior Auxiliary here to put on a fall frenzy event. You can check those guys out, too, online. And then Mason's High Octane Martial Arts is my oldest and longest business. It's been in business 30 years you visit masonsmartialarts.com. We have a martial arts business both in Covington and Millington. We'd be glad to help you out. And a new business I'm working on is Jam Books and Records. That's hopefully going to open in the next couple of weeks on the Covington Square. We'll have new and used books and records, so that should be a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully you guys will check that out. And then last but not, not least, if you need help with online marketing, uh, website design, commercials, drone footage, Josh will help you at masonitemarketing.com. Just check him out. And joining me tonight to protect her identity, we have DL Memphis. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you doing? I appreciate y'all taking the time too to to come down here. For those that are watching, this is pre-recorded on an evening, so we all stayed late uh, to get to do this for you guys. And it's, going up on Halloween. Yeah, it's and as it airs, you guys are getting ready to enjoy Halloween. Oh, I enjoy Halloween all year round. Is it a good guess that that's your favorite holiday? Yes. Why? You, honestly, I. Christmas and Thanksgiving have always been considered family oriented. However, we are constantly traveling. Mm -hmm. We are constantly going places and doing things. It's like party, family, party, family. So it's not really a family holiday. And I enjoy just getting together with my family and doing all kinds of really fun out there things. Uh, you know, I kind of agree with that. Mm -hmm. We do, we have a, uh, we always carve pumpkins together. And my children are adults now. And they all, we all got together. Uh, what night was it last they entertained they they were nice enough to all come together they wanted to do it and we did the pumpkin thing it was a nice family event you know, they get to eat little sugar cookies and stuff even though they're grown <laughs> my kids are grown too i actually um am passing a lot of these traditions down to grandchildren now um shh, that's a secret yeah i was gonna but, say you don't you don't look like you'd have grandchildren I, yeah that's that's a very well-kept secret mm -hmm. not really i i share it i'm like i'm old as dirt so i'm all for that so cool cool yeah. so tell us a little bit about yourself uh like i know you you have a podcast yourself right yes um i am part of a network and uh, the podcast that i do is called ice cream queens and we talk about anything that is considered dark pop culture so we talk a lot about horror movies we talk about true crime uh, myself and my other hostesses are kind of goth queens, so mm. we are out and about in that circuit as well. And we, we just go to what we want to do and enjoy life and then come back and talk about it. Hmm. So you said goth. What, is that, what does that mean to you? What Ooh. would be considered goth? I mean, I know what I think goth is more from school. What do you think goth is? I'm curious. Uh, I don't know that I'd necessarily define it with like qualities of the person it's more of a aesthetics that i'm familiar with you know darker hair darker makeup uh more uh yeah like darker clothing that kind of thing tends to be gothic maybe more into horror movies maybe metal if it's a guy maybe girls i don't know oh i'm a metalhead <laughs> okay shopping at hot topic uh, oh no, yeah 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 no, no. <laughs> You know, I, you know, as I think about it, I guess, and I guess you correct me if I'm wrong, but the mo maybe one of the most famous goth persons would be Elvira. Would you oh, think so? Oh, yes. Actually, um, I am a huge, huge Elvira fan. By the yeah, way. Yeah, me too. I'm sure, yeah. I don't know aren't. any guys that aren't. <laughs> Uh, true. That's true. I don't know many girls who aren't. Okay. Yeah. I, you. you know, they say that. My wife probably is too. Oh, and I have a, a, an amazing announcement, by the way. So Elvira has officially said when she retires, I get to be the queen of Halloween. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, congratulations. Not really. I'm oh, okay. I was going to say, maybe you'd met her before. Have you met her at a con or anything? I have met her several times, actually. Uh -huh. um, there might be a restraining order. There may be stalking. <laughs> I'm not sure. We're not discussing it. But yes, no, I have met her. Absolutely amazing person. Yeah. That's what I've heard. I yep. haven't met her myself, but I've heard. And she's still a very beautiful lady. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure what her age is now, but. Uh, In her 70s. Is she? Yes. Okay, yeah. And just 
gorgeous, gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have her signature tattooed on my back. Oh, do you? Yeah. I hope it's hers. It is. No, it is hers. Okay. She's, there's pictures of her actually signing my back, and um, I think she's actually pet, like, my corsets and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh. yeah, <laughs> there's a moment, yeah. So how long have you been into that type of stuff? Uh, the dark, you said dark pop culture, is that what you said? Yeah, pretty much all of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was uh, one of those kids that just gravitated to anything that was a bit more dark inclined. Love horror movies, grew up watching horror movies. Remember watching those with my mother and, you know, even when I wasn't supposed to kind of peeking around corners. So absolutely obsessed with everything from Universal Monsters on to mm -hmm. not huge into like torture horror type stuff, but... I can watch some of it. Um, read. I, I, I'm an avid reader, um, huge Anne Rice fan. So that's mm. just kind of been part of my my personality from the word go. Yeah, uh, you a fan of Rocky Horror? Oh, I'm a huge fan of Rocky <laughs> Horror. <laughs> yeah, we just finished it at the Ruffin Theater, and it was the uh, – they said – they told me Sunday afternoon that it was the most profitable show, show they've had in like two years. That really? They did. Yeah. Because it's not as expensive to put on as some of the Disney shows. Mm -hmm. Although, Franken, uh, Rock and Ho Rocky Horror Picture Show is owned by Disney now. So, technically, Frankenfurter is a Disney princess. I Yes, I have heard that. And I think he is probably the best Disney princess ever. I, I don't know that I disagree. <laughs> uh, my partner, Brian, played Frankenfurter in the show. And I'm Rocky in the show. So, so I just run around naked the whole time. Uh, like gold, gold it's, Speedo? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, Josh can throw a picture up so everyone can make fun of me. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I've done it now four out of the last five years. And the reason that I do, I didn't know anything about it, to be honest, in the beginning. Yeah, so I was raised, Josh and I both uh, was raised more of um, traditional, I guess. Not that we're not open to any other ideas and, and lifestyles, but we were, we were raised very traditional. I, I'll even tell you something I haven't told on here. You may find this interesting, and I'm not sure that we would get censored for what I'm about to say. But when I was a young martial arts instructor, I was like 16, my mother took class from me, okay? And uh, in the class, I would regularly regularly call children a term that I thought meant silly. I thought it meant they were be. It started with a D and ended in an O, and in the middle had an uh, ill uh, uh, in it. And I thought it meant silly. Mm. And uh, my mother had to pull me aside when she started and say, "Hey, you can't say that word." I was like, "Oh, they're just being a." Because I thought it meant uh, silly. And anyway, she had to educate me at 16. That's how sort of sheltered I was. Now, we did get raised on a lot of violent movies. I was going to say, I think you and I were raised a little well, different. We, we, I was watching Austin Powers at like six years yeah, old. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I, didn't, I wasn't really. It was, we watched the 1980s action movies, but we, did, we didn't, did, weren't really into any of that other stuff. So uh, my point was I, I was a little sheltered. So saying that, I didn't know anything about Rocky Horror. And then five years ago, my partner, um, the, the way I got into it is my partner comes to me. He was going to play Frankenfurter, and they didn't have a guy to play Rocky because nobody wanted to get up there naked, right? And he goes, uh, uh, you should try out. And I was like, no, I can't sing. You just got a singing role. I can't do that. And he goes, well, you tell everybody all the time that that's what they should do is they should try things they're afraid of to broaden their, their horizons. You're, you know, you're a liar, basically. You're not doing your own stuff. And I'm like, no, I'm not scared to do anything. I'll do whatever. So I auditioned, and then they gave me the part. And Definitely. so, yeah, it's not because I can sing. It's honestly nobody else was there. But now, fast forward, every year it forces me to get in shape because, I mean, you're up there in just speedos. So yeah, I enjoy it. But the the whole my whole my whole point in saying all that was that that is definitely more of a kind of a goth type play. And everybody in it that enjoys it and comes are, are amazing people. Like it's got a great, uh, they're awesome. The people that come and dress up, you know, and do that they're the cast and they do callbacks and the whole deal. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, shadow casting is a major thing for Rocky Horror fans. Um, now I know Ruffin is a historical mm -hmm. theater. So I imagine they don't get to do all of the. Yes, we do all of it. It's actually like throw rice. Uh -huh. Yeah, we did the whole thing. They throw rice. They throw toilet paper. We're we we do um, we talk back to them, and there's adult language used. Um, there's scantily clad ladies and everybody. men. Everybody. It's very a lot of people that have come out of Memphis said it was the best production they'd seen because of how far we go with it. Like it's a adult play. That is amazing because there are 
locations in Memphis where it is well known, well attended that you just you don't have that same interaction. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in high school and going up to I'm trying to think of the name of the theater, but there was it was right there by the University of Memphis. And I went there and was able to be part of the shadow cast. I remember throwing rice and throwing toast. And Mm -hmm. it was a it was a blast. And when you start talking to people that have not had that experience they don't understand other than just great music the attraction mm-hmm. well I, I mean i think the music's good the story is a little confusing <laughs> even after you've watched it a couple of times i think it's a little confusing but i think it's got a good message i think it's kind of about self-discovery you know oh, yeah. about being who you are and then and learning who you are because you know brad and janet sort of learn along the way but it's definitely an experience but that's how i hurt my back oh. is i'm rocky and in the play janet the actress that plays janet uh, kira who's a great girl and beautiful voice does a great job we have our love scene ends up being a dance like almost like a swing dance mm-hmm. so i she's smaller and so i uh i do this thing where i spin around my back and friday night I didn't get her back far enough um, to where I could catch her because I'm supposed to catch her legs, swing her around by her legs, and then catch her waist as she spins around me. Anyway, so I go to spin her around, and I, I, I knew, realized I wasn't going to be able to do it without dropping her. So I had to ch- change momentum midair and spin her the opposite way, and it threw my back out. Ooh. Because <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, so that, I'm just bringing up Rocky Horror, one, because I was in it, but two, because to me that's kind of goth culture, too, to some degree. There is actually another um, movie program that's kind of similar to that that has a shadow cast called uh, Repo the Genetic Opera. Never heard of it. It is absolutely amazing, and probably one of my favorite sopranos, uh, Sarah Brightman, is in it. Mm -hmm. And she is one of the main characters. She plays Blind Mag. And it has that same feel and that same vibe. So um, if it's ever an opportunity that you might be able to participate in that or bring that to a theater, I I'd do it in a heartbeat. That's an amazing show. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, talking about the horror stuff, what's like your favorite all time? Uh, okay, so this usually throws people. Um, my absolute favorite horror movie of all time is Amityville Horror, the original. The original, the 78 movie? Yes. I just watched it. Really? Every year I read a Halloween book theme. Usually I do the classic monster books, Dracula, Frankenstein, but I read the Amityville Horror novel. And so I wanted to watch the movie, too, and then I got in the rabbit hole of how true all of it was. So what is it about that movie that you enjoyed? Um, First of all, it was probably the first horror novel that I had ever read. Uh Um, And I remember being very young reading this and probably not even understanding half of it. And Mm -hmm. then actually just sitting down and watching the movie. I grew up in an era where, you know, parents would take kids to horror movies and they didn't really care about violence. They didn't care about sex. They didn't care about any of that aspect of it. They're just like, hey, let's go watch a movie because that seems like a family outing. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the original movies that I, that really just kind of stuck with me. But it's an, an incredible story, too. And then when you start realizing how that has developed and changed over the years and you look at the impact that it's had on the the surviving children and Mm -hmm. um, it's just an amazing creature that has bloomed into something totally different Mm -hmm. yeah so i read the book first Mm -hmm. uh, or i may have been midways through the book and read then watched the movie with my wife uh, as i had never seen the original Uh, and the book is scary like I enjoyed the book. I, I actually had trouble sleeping while the week or so that I was reading the book. So, it, the, but I did not like the movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, that is actually one of those movies where practical effects are uh, were somewhat used, but yeah. it was really a lot of slow burn storytelling. Mm-hmm. And if you are like my daughter, my youngest child is a horror junkie. And I asked her to sit down and watch this with me. And I looked over and she was sound asleep. And I'm mm-hmm. like, you jerk i love this movie why are you asleep yeah yeah so if you're used to something that's a little faster pace and also if you haven't watched it until now we're so used to seeing so many different dynamics Mm -hmm. on screen well i just i I don't know i I don't really watch horror movies i don't really yeah i'm not a big horror buff i've watched them Mm -hmm. like it was a kid and teenager i watched them sort of like that was the thing to do anyway and then i had a discussion with some friends you guys had uh who was it i was talking to about nightmare sisters josh that's probably bronson uh, yeah yeah so we used to get me and some of my friends used to get those kind of movies 
but not because they were horror movies, you know, because yeah. they had other components that teenage boys were interested in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some teenage girls do. Yeah, and that's cool. That's cool. That's even more cool, actually. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, anyway, my point was I, I just am not – I don't I, – as an adult, I, honestly, I don't know that I like the way they make me feel. I, I have a fear of um, – I guess if I was honest, I don't like thinking about things that I can't control or, or uh, harm like, or defend against. You know, like a person I'm not afraid of because you can hurt a person, but uh, a demon or a ghost or that kind of stuff, I don't like thinking about that kind of stuff. It makes me uncomfortable, especially if it has ill intent, you know. I'm a skeptic, and we I have traveled around to so many different places that claim to be haunted, and I am one of those people that I'm like, oh, I can explain this away. I can totally explain just about every situation we've been in. Um, Things that involve demonic entities, demons, that kind of stuff. I, I grew up a, in a church environment, and um, I, act, I mean, for years I was actually, my church is a librarian. Mm-hmm. So there's an element of that that really just makes me very uncomfortable, and it makes me, because that is a bit more real. Um, I'm more frightened of people. I find myself watching true crime. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a, one of those girls. I love true crime, and I watch it and I'm like what we do to ourselves is a lot more evil than anything that could ever be portrayed on film created by them yeah I don't know that I I don't disagree with that I just personally you know the true crime thing is very I mean I'm a criminal defense lawyer yeah you know like literally all day I've been dealing with people accused of I literally murder like I had two guys that are charged with murder that I talked with today on their cases uh you know, rapes, child stuff, yeah. uh, you know, there's lots of stuff that I deal with on a real basis. And I guess, I mean, I'm personally not afraid of them, um, but I, that probably goes because I'm confident, you know, with my, you know, I can handle myself if I had to, so I'm not afraid of that, I guess. But also they're human, you know, like I think a lot of people demon, like almost like turn them into monsters, which they may be for what they did, but they're not, they're humans, you know, like you can hurt them. Um, and then it's interesting to me too, on the true crime thing, how a lot of these people, you know, a lot of the people I represent did do it. You know, some of them are, many of them are innocent, but a lot of them did what they're accused of. And often it's justified somehow to them. So like what they did really is justified to them. It was okay in their brain. Um, the real weird ones are the ones that involve, um, you know, uh, different types of sexual crimes where they really fervently think that what it what they did was justified. Um, but that that part's interesting. But either way, they're you know they're human. I, so I'm I'm just not really bothered by them most of the time. See, and that's the element that unnerves me the most is the fact that they can justify that in mm-hmm. their brain. And being a female um, and growing up in in the Memphis area, because I mean, this is not the safest no, area in the world, mm-hmm. and, and you are basically told be on alert be on guard and you know i've worked in environments where we've had uh people come in that have ill intent and it it it's not that i'm not uncomfortable around or that i'm uncomfortable around people it's just that sometimes i don't know what the intent is and being on this side of it i'm always concerned what could happen so it, mm. it's Human element is the most unpredictable element. Well, I, I think, too, a lot of times men especially probably take for granted how uh, you might feel as a, as a woman, you know, walking around there. And then me especially, I used to look for trouble, almost <laughs> like I was on the hunt. when I, Especially when I was a young martial arts guy, I was ready to try it. I was like, what? You looking at me? You know, I, when I was in law school, I, they tried to rob me two times. There's two different times they attempted to rob me unsuccessfully. Uh so I'm just did it, and then I was a cop for 12 years, a SWAT guy. I mean, fought MMA. So like dealing with people physically, even with weapons and stuff, is just not um, as frightening to me. And so regardless of male female, I think the training helps a lot. You know, I have a, a very high confidence level of my ability to handle myself if I had to. But like even my wife, who's a kickboxing world champion, so Madeline and I, uh, she's a fifth degree black belt That's amazing. and a kickboxing world champion, can handle herself. I do get nervous like at night when she goes, she likes to go run and stuff at night and that makes me nervous uh, for her. So I, I understand, I guess I can see being concerned about that people element. Well, and it's the element of surprise because mm-hmm. when you're out running or you're out running an errand or you're not expecting somebody to run up and grab you or mm-hmm. run up and do something. So it is the element of surprise. And I mean, I, I hate to say it. I mean, 
Madeline sounds like an absolute badass. I'm sorry if I can't say that. No, you can say whatever okay. you like. Uh, we could have said the other word too, but just in case. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Boss bitch. No, I was okay. I was talking about I was talking about the D word that I censored myself oh, on. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm the one who usually breaks the rules about what yeah. I can say and can't say. Well, th- yeah. So just so you're clear, on my show, this is just goes on Facebook or YouTube, right? And if they take it down, like it, I don't. It's not like I'm hurt by it. It's just whoever. Okay. I don't answer to anyone, so you say whatever you like. Okay, awesome. But I mean, honestly, you know, she's she is probably a badass and somebody would probably think twice about coming up to her if they know her background Mm -hmm. but it's that element of surprise and i mean honestly she could probably hold her own but also i understand that genetically men are going to be a bit more stronger and are going to have that advantage Mm -hmm. well you know i teach a program my wife and i both do called sharp it's sexual harassment assault and rape prevention Oh, cool. And it's got a couple different components. And one of the main, one of the first things we teach is how to, dis- so there's there's different personality profiles that women will show. And there's one in particular that uh, uh, usually male assailants will target. And so if you can be, one of them is a, a confrontational, which is the type woman that looks to fight, basically. And we don't say be that. But there's <laughs> an assertive personality, which is you're confident, you, you can make eye contact, but you're not... Uh, you know, you don't look passive or weak. And that's the it's my, po- my point in the, the training is that you may not be an assertive personality. That's fine. But you want to know what that looks like so you know how to portray that. So when you are walking around, you, you can portray that personality and maybe be less likely a target. And one of the ways to do that is eye contact. A lot of people really struggle with, you know, if you're walking, say you got the traditional um, construction worker set up, the woman's walking and the hoot and hollering from the construction workers. Well, they're less likely to do that if you're able to make eye contact with them where they're it just becomes more of a personal thing you've got confidence and maybe they don't but when you ignore them or don't look or tuck tuck your head then you become more of a target so uh my point is like that that's something i think everybody could benefit from show a little confidence and then we also talk about your just situ- situational awareness you know if it's late at night don't park by the white van with no light near it you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. just be smart don't take don't don't offer to go pet the puppies in the middle mm-hmm. of the night that kind of thing yeah yeah totally get it on your podcast where do people listen to that um you can listen to us on facebook on youtube we're also uh, so those are generally live streams mm-hmm. and then you can find us on spotify so anywhere that you would listen to a podcast you can find us and who does that with you um uh, so geeky gothic gamer girl which is uh she's pretty well known on TikTok. Um, and then I have another co-host by the name of Magda, who is, she's, oh my God, Scottish, has the beautiful accent, absolutely gorgeous girl. She um, comes in and sits in with us occasionally. She's more of like a part-time co-host with us, whereas uh, Geeky Gothic Gamer Girl is more of my, my full-time counterpart. Every time you call her name, you have to say Geeky Gothic I usually call Gamer her G for. <laughs> okay, I was gonna <laughs> say, that makes more sense. I usually call her by her real is name. Is the DL honestly. an abbreviation? Or is it just? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, but we don't say what the abbreviation is. <laughs> it's a secret. Oh, I guess I would know what that is then. That makes <laughs> sense. Well, I didn't know it was like down low or something like that. So, uh, as an abbreviation. Hey, you know, next year I don't know that I'm going to do it again. But if I do Rocky Horror again and we think about it, I could always come on y'all show in costume. Yes. Yeah, since it's sort of goth, right? Oh no! I, honestly, you can come on our show anytime because you know, with the true crime element, mm-hmm. oh my God, we would love to. Sit oh, I'd be glad to, to talk to you. I got a really big case right now. I, I can't really actively talk about it, but uh, it has gotten me a lot of uh, unwanted attention. Oh, um, yeah. Well, let me ask you that your opinion on that, just okay. just as I'm curious. Mm-hmm. So I have gotten um, like I represent. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. People that I represent are accused of crimes. And this one in particular I've got, uh, there was a lot, there's a lot of negativity towards me on it for taking the case. And then people are like, uh, people, people that have done that don't deserve a lawyer or they should just go under the prison or I can't believe you would do that. Or like the one we got recently was, uh, the comment was um, that it, it was sickening to this person that I would represent people that I know did it. In other words, if I know they're guilty and I still represent them and try to protect their interest, quote, get them off, that's sickening. I'm just curious what your thinking is on that when you look at all the true crime stuff. 
honestly, I think that from your profession, you have to kind of approach it like a medical standpoint. When you go into that profession, you take a Hippocratic oath that you are going to do everything you can to help this person. And honestly, I mean, there are some people that we know did it, and but there's information to be gathered. I am never going to say, no, you are not correct for taking that case. Um, because honestly, what you're going to share on the other side of that might be extremely needed information to help catch people like that in the future mm -hmm. i mean if you look at people like um uh i'm drawing a blank oh my gosh uh big tall shout it if you know it the big tall guy that i'm uh, ed kemper thank you so much i just went but ed kemper is one of those fascinating people that in, in all honesty, it, he would have never been defended and he would have uh, been put to death. There's an aspect of uh, catching serial, uh, serial killers and criminals that would have never been brought to light. I mean, you look at uh, Mindhunter, the, the book and the show, it's all about the development of um, the um, FBI's behavioral, is it FBI? behavioral science unit mm -hmm. i mean absolutely amazing but honestly if somebody would have never been put in that situation they would have never had that information mm -hmm. yeah well and i i agree with what you said i look at it like this the constitution says that the burden is on the state mm -hmm. and legally until the state has carried the burden and proven them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt they are innocent they are legally innocent now they may factually be guilty and may have actually done something but the state has the burden to prove that. And the reason I think that's so important is because prior to our Constitution, um, there was a time, even our own history, where the burden was on the person accused. And the state could come just take your stuff. There was Your civil liberties weren't protected. And so I really think if you value the Constitution, you have to value criminal defense lawyers because we are the main line of defense to protect those liberties. And it's easy for people to say, well, you shouldn't defend that person or this person until it's you. You know, then all of a sudden I have so many people come in here that uh, are accused of things and I think are actually innocent and are shocked that the system got it wrong and is working against them. And they're like, but wait, but wait, you know, it's me. And then you want an advocate, you know, a strong advocate. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to break the laws or any ethical rules, but I'll do whatever I can within my power to protect their rights and then fervently advocate for their uh, defense. And, you know, often they still get convicted. So, you know, I mean, it is what it is. But I think that you have to have an unbiased, uh, zealous advocate uh, per the Constitution and for justice to actually occur. And we have a saying, I forget which Supreme Court justice it was, but the saying is, I would rather have a thousand guilty people walk free than one innocent person be convicted. And, uh, you know, I believe that. So that's kind of my position on it. But I, I get, I get, I, I don't normally get frustrated by any of the comments. I was joking earlier about the hair comments and stuff. <laughs> I normally don't care. But it, it's a little frustrating to me, I think, when people comment based on ignorance and they haven't walked a day in somebody else's shoes, you know, it's really easy to j pass judgment. Also, walking into your office, a lot of times you have information, but do you have all of the information? Or is it something that you are sitting down and interviewing people and drawing additional information that might be relevant to the case that people might not necessarily know going into it? Yeah, so a lot of times we don't have all the information. As a matter of fact, probably 90 plus percent of the times, it's just whatever the client tells you. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know what the state does or doesn't have. And the big case I was talking about um, that I have right now, the court, so a lot of people don't know this, but in Tennessee, in general sessions court or some of the city courts that have sessions power, lawyers don't have discovery rights, which means whatever evidence they have, statements, pictures, videos, forensics, any of that, we're not entitled to it. So they don't give it to us. It's a probable cause court. So all we really know is what the client says and then maybe what's on the affidavit of complaint from the cop. That's literally all we know. So sometimes it takes a while, and usually you're in that court for several months before you get to the next level court where we then have motions power, and I can file a motion to, for discovery evidence, and then I'm entitled to whatever exculpatory evidence they may have um, against the client. And then you start to really start seeing the full picture of if there's something or not. And sometimes it's still you know, not, I have a case today I'm dealing with that I think is a self-defense case. And I don't think that the evidence supports what they've charged the guy with. He's charged with attempted second degree murder. And I think he was defending himself. I think it's pretty clear that the evidence shows he was defending himself, but he's looking at a B felony, a sub, sub serious prison time, uh, if convicted. And I think that they've gotten it wrong. I think he's legitimately, 
I think he's innocent. I think he's just using the weapon in self-defense. So, how often do you have someone come in? I'm going to shift. I'm going to start asking questions because this oh, is what I do. That's fine. <laughs> uh, so, how often do you have somebody come in that you're looking at the case and you're you're like, there's there's things that are missing that might actually shift this to be um, an innocent person. Uh, well, I, I think it's hard to give a specific percentage because, like, for instance, my D, I do a lot of DUI cases, and those are a little different because sometimes maybe they had been drinking, but there's definitely some reasonable doubt that they were impaired at the time. So it's sort of a gray area to me on some of the DUIs, um, whether they're, uh, you know, they're a little guilty maybe, but are they guilty enough to be convicted? So that, that if I exclude those, though, and you go into, like, the murders and, and rapes and stuff like that, I would say probably 10 to 15 percent are probably innocent, honestly. It's probably higher than most people think, but lower than I'd actually like to admit, because then the vast majority of the other people are guilty. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, Josh would be a good one to ask because everything's, you know, he's under my attorney-client privilege, so he has to be, uh, it's all confidential too. He's, but he sits right here outside my office and hears a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, Josh? To think about what the percentage uh, yeah, is. Yeah, the people that you think after you hear it are probably innocent. Yeah, you're probably right. It's probably about 10 to 15 percent. Mm -hmm. I would say the majority of them you can tell from the minute they first open their mouth. Mm -hmm. I can be a pretty good judge of whether or not they, <laughs> they did it or not. You know, but yeah, it's probably yeah. accurate. Probably 10, 10 to 15 percent. Well, also, if you're in a position where people do not necessarily think that you're the person that's going to be taking notes, you'd be surprised what people will say and do in front of you when they don't think that you're the person that is going to actually be defending them or helping them. Um, I'm in a I'm in an environment where I do professional development, and um, there are times that people come in and they sit down with me and they start talking, because uh, especially if they're prepping for an interview and they don't realize that they're going to be actually interviewing with me, mm -hmm. and they will start telling me all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And you can make people very uncomfortable just with silence, and mm -hmm. you know all of those little tips and techniques that um, like police interviewers use. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm from an LEO family as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I have applied a lot of those techniques when it comes to actually interviewing and, and working with people and then sharing. It's like, listen, this is what this is what you're doing and this is how you need to fix that. But, yeah, it, yeah I have actually been in positions where people came in and would say some of the rudest things to me. And because I'm where I was sitting at the time, and then I'd go in and sit in an interview with me with them, and they were like, "Oh my God, I'm interviewing with you." I'm like, "Yeah, you probably shouldn't have said that." <laughs> yeah, no, you're right, uh, and I think knowing those kind of uh, sort of psychological cues with people is important, even in what I do. Mm -hmm. Lawyers, in some ways, are actors and psychiatrists or, or psychologists because when I do jury trials, like tomorrow we have a murder trial starting. Now it's going to end up, my partner's going to do the voir dire portion because I've got to go to another county first for uh, five other clients we have and then come back. But in the jury selection especially, you're trying to plant the seed of your theme, uh, whatever the theme of the case is, and read the jury. You have to, because you want to get rid of people that are biased. You, you want to know, and we research them. Like we get uh, questionnaires that's got some of their information. And then we assign paralegals to go through their Facebook, social media, all kinds of stuff to see who they voted for. Are they pro-gun? Are they this, that, the other? And then we've already marked that as we're asking them questions and we're trying to find their biases because we want a jury that's, you know, sort of like-minded with what the theme of the case is. And so a lot of attorneys, and, and I don't know that it's uh, as weighted as some of them say, but a lot of attorneys think you win and lose trials based on jury selection. That if you pick the right jury, you're going to get the right verdict. Um, but then even after that, we are actors in selling our argument. You know, I, I even am conscious of like how I'm dressed. Uh, you don't want to look like you got too much money, but you don't want to look like a, the, the poor lawyer they're not going to listen to. You know, you can't look frumpy. Um, just it, we even tested the colors of suits and stuff like politicians to see what would sell best on what this argument is. Um, it's just it, but and then you've got it can't look like a performance, though. You mm -hmm. know, you get people read through that. It's got to be authentic. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of it does go off of the same cues you would use in law enforcement that I used before. And I think I think the law enforcement really helped me in being a jury lawyer, trial lawyer. Interesting. Yeah. So some of the things that you were just sharing are aspects that are applied in fundraising as well. Like mm -hmm. um, you want to look polished and you want to look put together and you want to look professional, but you don't want to look too rich. You don't want to mm -hmm. look too fancy. Um, you want to look like you're having fun and um, 
there's aspects of that that apply across. It's all levels. sales. It is. Everything it's all is sales. sales. Yeah, I say that all the time. I'm reading uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's new book right now in chapter, I think it's five, is sell, sell, sell. And, and it's right. Everything is sales. Uh, no matter if you're in politics or law or um, uh, education, education, anything really, you're trying Medical. to sell. Yeah, yeah, it's all sales. Uh, even in relationships, I'm sure sometimes you're trying to sell certain things to to your man over there. Of so. course, of course, it's like that's how you get all the fancy, pretty, sparkly things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, one more topic here, since we're uh, talking about Halloween, I'll ask you what you think. Uh, what are, what would be your all time favorite costume? And I know that's hard to say because you say you do Halloween year-round, basically, but what's, like, even from kid forward, what's, like, the costume you remember wearing the most? Okay, so I'm a cosplayer, and that is one of those areas that um, is very difficult to answer because going out and doing Halloween events, I, that's a totally different ball of wax there. Mm-hmm. Um, my absolute favorite go-to lately um, – I'm going to say probably has been Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Michelle Pfeiffer's black latex stitched up suit. That is a blast to wear. Mm-hmm. Not to mention you get to wear stacked boots and you get to play with a whip. Well, I would assume you would get attention. Oh, God, yeah. That. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a lot of fun. So you enjoy the attention? Oh, that's that's why we do this. Okay. You know? Well, I appreciate you saying that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably uh, my favorite Halloween costume growing up. I'm 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 a child of the '70s, so I'm gonna say Wonder Woman. Uh huh. It's like I think I still have the Ben Cooper Wonder Woman playset uh-huh. that um you know that. That's cool. Yeah. That might be worth something. Oh yeah. You see my office is all Superman. Uh, my wife she likes super. She she I, I managed to manipulate her into liking Wonder Woman just so that when I go to do comic books, it supports I can get her a comic book and it supports the addiction. Sort of. She gets to get into Wonder Woman. So she actually has a, a really good Wonder Woman comic book collection. Oh, wow. Because to justify all the purchases I make, I make sure she gets, like, really good graded <laughs> vintage Wonder Woman. And then we checked the other day, and she's got a – I mean, it's a very good collection of, like, old Wonder Woman comic books. I, I actually have a pretty extensive collection. Um, I But I also have, like, a lot of the books and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um there's one that I have that's an older, it's an older, I don't want to say it was 1970, 1972. I'll have to find a copy of it, but um, I have it and it's probably one of my pi- prize pieces. Um, Do you collect like the old, um, uh, there's there's some folks online that I watch in the comic book world and a couple of them are into goth stuff. And there's some of the women in particular that like to collect the old uh, uh, like horror magazines. It's like, isn't there like Vampirilla? Yeah, the Vampirilla one? stuff, like, like that. Um, I, um, I love Vampirilla. Honestly, um, my initial start into a lot of this was pinup. So mm. I have a tendency to gravitate towards pulp novels and anything that has that depiction of like um, pinup girls in that 1940s. Um, design. I, yeah, I, I think that's a really uh, underrated uh, look. The pinup look. I was literally talking today at lunch with my um, partner about this. There's a girl that we see in the the drug court who walked in, young girl, young lady. I shouldn't say girl. Uh, she's the girl to me because I'm old. Anyway, she walked in and she's got like Farrah Fawcett flyback bangs. Oh wow! And it's pretty, yeah. you know. And I was like, man, that's a good hairstyle. I said, I wish that, uh, you know, I think more women could bring that back. And I said, and I, I literally told him, I said, you know. The, the 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 look that I think people really should bring back more is like the Betty Page, you know, little Bob looking look thing. Is that 50s or 40s? Uh, is Betty Page 40s? was 1950s. Okay, yeah. That, I mean, those are some, you know, very attractive hairstyles. And Oh, Betty Page was amazing, and I'm a huge, huge Betty fan. Yeah. So who would you say is the best pinup ever, your favorite? Uh, my favorite is always going to be Betty. Just that's going to mm-hmm. be my go-to. But um, outside of that, probably not really so much pinup, but um, she did. Um, I love Tora Satana as well, um, who was in Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. And, I mean, just she's another one of those exotic, amazing just gothic women so do you think that all of that falls I'm, and, and we're sort of getting into a whole uh, different topic here with that stuff <laughs> but do you think uh like the burlesque shows part of why they are popular is because because it infers things without showing things you know what i mean implied nudity yeah 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 you think I, that's missing i think that's missing a lot more nowadays is people are just hey look 
Well, and there's an aspect of that, um, and that, that's one of the reasons why I don't really talk a lot about like my my real name and everything because um, I am an internationally published pennant model, um, and I do have some overzealous fans. And a lot of people don't realize that what they're looking at is 100% implied nudity. Mm -hmm. You never see a thing and there's an element of burlesque that kind of goes hand in hand with that when even i know several burlesque dancers and they are amazing amazing people but when they get to the just the the bare bones it's really pasties and a g-string mm -hmm. so i mean you never really see anything and most of the time it's like rip it off shake it and run off stage mm -hmm. yeah so again i think that that's something we're losing in today's society is how to uh solicit those responses without just giving the cake away, <laughs> you know what I An mean? Like, element of mystery. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> I think that that's kind of missing nowadays. I have a lot of kids come. The reason I say that is one of the recent things is a lot of the boys, especially, they're sending these photos, nude photos. The teenage boys are right, and the girls are too. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is they're getting catfished by these dudes that then in like uh, you know I don't know Liberia or somewhere or India. Yeah, or that then take those photos. They'll text the kid back and say, hey, I got your pictures, and if you don't pay me X amount of dollars, I'm going to send them to your family, you know, to all these people. And now these boys are terrified, trying to figure out how they're getting blackmailed. And then the cops can't, and the FBI and everybody can't do anything about it because it's literally in some other, you know, foreign nation that we're not in. And uh, and then they're doing it. They're getting blackmailed, you know. And honestly, that's that's education. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I have two adult daughters, and I mean, one of the first things that we basically beat in their heads with a cell phone, it's like, somebody's going to ask you for nudie pictures. Please don't send them. Do mm -hmm. not send them, because this is not where it's going to end. That, that, that picture of you is going to be shown to all of his friends, and mm -hmm. then Lord forbid that y'all should break up. It's going to go everywhere. Well, and if they're underage, yeah. uh, you can be charged. There's a couple of areas that have actually done this. If you have on your, if you're 16 and you have a picture of yourself mm -hmm. nude on your phone, you're in possession of child pornography. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, they've even charged. I, I don't know if they do it locally because I don't know how to hold up, but they've literally charged people with photos of themselves, kids. Um, and then if an adult, if you're 18 and you got a 17-year-old sending you pictures, it may not be statutory rape, but every one of those photos is a federal offense for exchanging uh, uh, por child pornography uh, electronically. So it's just a huge deal. If they're, I mean, you shouldn't be sending them anyway, honestly, because like you say, even as adults, this stuff's going to get passed around. Oh, yeah. But these kids especially, it's very dangerous. And they have no idea how far it will go and who all is going to see it. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, I am part of a, a law enforcement family. My, my husband recently retired, but he was part of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised how many cases were brought to him where basically somebody has sent pictures of yeah. themselves to their quote boyfriend and it, next thing you know it's like everywhere yeah he would probably find this interesting i got interviewed uh two weeks ago because of this one case by uh chris hansen oh. and when his uh publicist called me to set up the interview i told him that i would only do it if it wasn't in a kitchen <laughs> and i thought it was funny his publicist did not think it was funny because <laughs> I mean, it, and it wasn't. He was real. He was actually a really nice guy when he talked to me. He was real nice and uh, just went through the thing. And uh, he even gave me a cell phone number and told me to call him if I needed anything. I haven't called him, but I thought that was nice of him. Oh, that's funny. You get yeah. Chris Hansen's cell phone number. I have Honey the Mail Girl's cell phone number. Uh, well, we can trade. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. That would be a good trade. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Well, why don't you do this? Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you and follow your content and all that stuff? Sure. Um, you can find me on Facebook and enter or Facebook and Instagram under DL Memphis. Um, if you m can catch me on TikTok, I'm not a huge TikTok fan. I'm just I just don't really use it that much. But it's DL is mildly psychotic, um, and most of the stuff that I post generally gets taken down anyway. <laughs> oh, nice. I'm like, there's boobs everywhere, but they don't like mine. Interesting. I know. Yeah, no, I, I've been getting Josh. So poor Josh over there, he loads my TikToks <laughs> and stuff, right? And so he kind of sees what my feed is, and uh, he says, I hate opening it every time, and I'll have to tell you his, later. His before. For You page yeah. is very unfortunate. That's <laughs> all I'll <laughs> say. <laughs> uh, the other thing is Ice Cream Queens. You can find us on um, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. And I just, if you're a fan of horror, you're a fan of anything creepy and, you know, 
chaotic. Mm-hmm. Find us, follow us. We're well, even if they're not immediately a fan, it's good to broaden your horizons a little bit, your perspectives. Oh, yeah. and check out things maybe you're not so comfortable. Like Rocky has been great, and I normally would have never thought that was something I would have been into. Uh, but it's great. We enjoy it. Every year. Every year. Yeah. Every year. Well, thanks again for being on the show with us. You're and uh, I'd be glad to come and uh, join you ladies and learn some stuff. Or, oh, yeah. Or, or talk about the cases or whatever. Uh, and I thank you guys, too, for watching us. I uh, hope you're having a good Halloween. Please be safe. If you get arrested, call me. As always, don't forget to like and follow, subscribe to our content. We're on all social media platforms. We're also on TikTok. Um, one of these days, I am going to put Josh doing a dance. So we haven't done it yet. But Negative. One Negative. day, we're going to get him over there dancing. And then, as I mentioned, NA, the band, local guys, download their album, Inside My Head. I want to support them. It's completely free, so please do that. And the Michelle Allen's a longtime sponsor. If you're going to buy, sell, rent, lease real estate, she'd be glad to help you out. And I know right now she's working hard on that uh, fall frenzy with Junior Auxiliary in Tipton County. So you can check them out. Mason's High Octane Martial Arts. Just visit masonsmartialarts.com. We're running a 30-year anniversary special, both our locations, Millington and in Covington. Uh, and then the new business I'm working on is Jam Books and Records, new and used books and records. And we'll eventually have a recording studio too, but hopefully you can check that out. I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks we need to be open so y'all can buy Christmas presents. And then uh, last, we got old Josh. He'll help you out with your online branding, marketing, email. Um, he'll do your laundry, whatever you need. Masonitemarketing.com. $20 is $20. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for another Law Talk. We'll see you every Tuesday, hopefully around 5 o'clock. Um, hope you guys have a good ha- Halloween, good safe Halloween, and keep kicking. Thanks for watching, guys. Just remember that this is not legal advice or investment advice or business advice. This is for fun and entertainment purposes only.